With us today is Bob Exler, and Bob has a long and varied past in the field of ufology, everything from being a private researcher to being a director with MUFON. Bob has been out of the active field of ufology here for the last several years, but we're very pleased to bring Bob back today. And we are going to go through and discuss with Bob his background, his encounters, and the information that he has, people he has met, and so forth. So, Bob, we welcome you. To Thank you, Chris. Uh, delighted to have an opportunity after so many years, essentially, away from active involvement in the field to come back and, in, in essence, reflect on uh, what I learned over several decades of involvement in research and investigation. Great. And uh, what was your background before you got into UFOs, unless, of course, UFOs was of interest to you when you were uh, a kid? But uh, what, what was your professional background, and from that, how did that lead into your interest with uh, UFOs and ufology? That's a difficult one, actually, to even <laughs> begin to start with. Um, I really was totally unfamiliar with uh, UFOs uh, growing up, and uh, just to kind of encapsulate the time frame for everyone, uh, uh, I graduated, graduated from high school back in the late 60s, 1967, and uh, had participated in uh, the, uh, the Vietnam War. My father was uh, a chief senior pilot in the Air Force, uh, and I remember running across something about UFOs once uh, and asking him, and he basically shut me out. Uh, had absolutely no interest in speaking about it at all. Um, not that, and he wouldn't even convey whether or not he had any kind of belief in it or whether he had any unusual encounters in all of his tenure in the Air Force, uh, which I thought was rather strange. It kind of left a little, just a little thought in the back of my mind that uh, maybe there really was something going on, and but it wasn't worthy of discussion, perhaps. And so... I pretty well set it aside. Uh, in the uh, mid-70s, uh, I started working with NASA. My uh, area of expertise had developed into the field of robotics, and uh, that would evolve into uh, developing a robotics firm that was actually a collective of some eight companies that I put together in a consortium uh, to develop some. Uh, I, I was actually the first person, according to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, to take uh, advanced robotic concepts out of the factory and mobilize it in a variety of forms, and including developing the first uh, digital system for remote controlling um, airborne systems, and also apply that to ground systems and uh, uh, watercraft as well. But uh, that fairly early on in the development process, uh, once we you know, were able to prove the technology, uh, got absconded by the U.S. military for uh, obvious military applications for some of it. But no, that's, uh, that was my reigning area of expertise. Uh, I got to work with a Canadian firm that developed the uh, robotic arm for the shuttle program in its early infant stages. And had, uh, so I had a technology background that uh, when in 1980 rolled around, uh, that's when I tripped over uh, an organization in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. that was actively involved in um, UFO research. And some of the members of that uh, group, uh, the, called the Fund for UFO Research, or FUFOR, I guess for short, uh, involved... Uh, People like uh, Dr. Bruce McAbee, who I later became good friends with over the years and uh, still maintain contact with to this day, and uh, got involved subsequently in a tremendous amount of research and a number of cases uh, over the succeeding decades uh, from 1980 forward. And, uh, of course, that uh, uh, what really interested me was the fact that here we had people who had scientific backgrounds, uh, uh, diverse backgrounds in all kinds of professions, 
that were expressing a serious interest in the phenomenon of UFOs. And that certainly got me to thinking that maybe there really was something to this whole field. I mean, any time you heard anything on the news, it was all shock and ridicule and smirking and Billy Bob with a six-pack of beer saw some strange lights in the night sky, that sort of thing. And that got me thinking about what's going on here. Why are people having somebody who comes along and expresses an interest or sees something unusual and is looking for an answer, why are these people suddenly ridiculed in the press? And that just didn't make sense to me. So that really was the point that got me totally suckered into taking a much, much closer look at what might be going on with UFOs. So that's at least a start. Now I'll throw it back to you, Chris. Let's see where we want to go from here. Sure. Well, was there something that you saw or something that triggered, as you said, you kind of stumbled across the group in Maryland there that included a well-known individual to all of us here, Bruce McAbee. Was there something that you saw at NASA or information that you were hearing along the way, kind of the whispers in the hall type thing, where there was any conversation going on concerning UFOs that were seen or experiences that, whether it was astronauts that were having or engineers were seeing in the data that they were collecting? Well, I suppose if I reflect back to the late 60s and our grand push from President Kennedy to go to the moon, really that was kind of the first glimpse that we had of a space program. I mean, I do remember back earlier when Sputnik, so I did get to see Sputnik go flying over, which was the first time that we'd actually technologically sent something up into space, we meaning mankind. And so that was intriguing, but it never occurred to me during any of those times that there might be something along the lines of what would be considered non-human existence and technologies. In 1980 or thereabouts, I ran across a flyer for a conference on UFOs, which is how I discovered the Fund for UFO Research. And that was really what got me thinking. I had no personal involvement. I hadn't seen anything that I would consider to be unusual in terms of UFOs. So I really had no personal stake in it any which way until that time. But as I got involved in some of the meetings that I attended and went to the conference that the Fund for UFO Research had put together, I began to realize that there were a lot of people who throughout history, at least the previous 40 years or so of history at that time, who had made some pretty wild claims, including things of personal involvement with, I guess you would describe as an alien species, an entirely different type of humanoid apart from human beings, which, again, I had no proof. It was all just the different things. I found books that had been written and started doing a little bit of research to find out what was going on. And the papers that the Fund for UFO Research had published is what really got me delving in to see what did people know, what were people saying, what's going on here? Is there something that, and why is this all being kept from public knowledge? That started my research end of it. Investigation-wise, I got more actively involved shortly after my initial involvement with the Fund for UFO Research in taking a look at specific cases. And I had discovered that there were unusual things that happened very close in my own backyard, essentially, around Annapolis, Maryland, and all around the Washington, D.C. area. And in the papers that I read from the Fund for UFO Research, I had discovered that there had been some extraordinary events that had been recorded even on radar back in the early 1950s, right here in Washington, D.C. 
And so I began to realize that there was a body of evidence that uh, suggested that something else was going on that suggested that perhaps we are not the only intelligent species in the cosmos. And uh, considering the fact that uh, whoever they were and wherever they came from, uh, technologically, had to clearly be more advanced than us in order to get here. We weren't going to visit them. They were coming to visit us. So that, again, was a point of, of great intrigue for me. And uh, so, so I started to get involved actively in investigations uh, uh, with some of the other teams and Bruce McAbee and some of the things that he was doing. And since I had this expertise in a variety of related fields to robotics, um, including you know optic systems, and of course Bruce McAbee was an, is an optical physicist, so uh, we had a camaraderie right from the start as far as that was concerned. And there were a number of other people there as well who had various uh, backgrounds in technology that uh, were applying their investigative tools to unraveling things, and some were basically their sole purpose was to, in essence, debunk what was uh, being claimed as UFO activity. And that intrigued me as well, so I began to realize that there was uh, almost like a war going on between those who seemed to believe and those who didn't believe, and uh, it gave rise to the issue of, well, what is reality and what is belief? And that's really the core of what got me really interested in UFOs and trying to get to the bottom of, is this real? What is real? And what is indeed going on? Where would you like to go from here? Sure. Well, I can see how uh, that connection would be for you being heavily involved in engineering and robotics, and you're looking at something that appears to be so superior to anything that you've seen or worked with. Um, I guess from the group of people that you're working with there, then um, I believe at that point in time, um, Maccabee had had personal experiences uh, in terms of uh, sightings and data provided to him. Um, had you had any personal experiences by this point in time, or uh, is that yet to come? I probably have to say... I did not have any genuine personal experience that uh, that I would describe as interesting, um, and certainly nothing in the way of uh, what anybody might describe as a you know, visitation of sorts. Uh, um, and you know, the work that I had done uh, through NASA, while much of it was uh, relatively classified at the time, certainly. Uh, didn't give rise to any indications that uh, I was uh, uh, that, that I had had any personal experience. It probably wasn't uh, really until I started getting involved in uh, more uh, extraordinary cases. Uh, probably the first one where I really got to start applying my um, expertise to would have been the uh, the Gulf Breeze sightings that started initially back in. Uh, 1986, and in 1987, a local builder there by the name of Ed Walters had uh, some extraordinary encounters that he had recorded on an old Polaroid film camera, the old type that uh, where you take a picture, you pull it, pull out the sheet, and you peel it apart, and you, know, you wait 60 seconds or something and peel it apart, and then you put a, a, a fixer uh, film over top of it and then you're left with a picture. And he had taken quite a series of these photographs of some unusual objects that were appearing in his uh, local area there. And, I mean, the story exploded into a, a lot more than that, and uh, I ended up taking uh, more than a dozen extended trips down to the northwest uh, Florida panhandle to uh, do on-site field investigations involving a phenomenon that went on for years and involved literally hundreds of photographers using uh, video, film, uh, every kind of uh, uh, type of uh, recording device that uh, was available uh, to record incidents that were occurring on a regular basis. 
Uh, I subsequently got involved with Dr. Dan Oberlade, who uh, now deceased, unfortunately, but he uh, was um, one of the top psychiatrists in the country. Uh, he was the president of the Psychiatric Association out of San Francisco and uh, lived there in this little town of Gulf Breeze and had 24 families that were patients. Uh, we tend to call them cases, I guess, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, these were uh, families that had uh, strangely migrated to this little peninsula town outside of Pensacola uh, from all over uh, a wide area of geography, most of whom didn't really, you know, I mean, you could trace little bits and pieces of things as to why they ended up in this little town, but they all essentially migrated to this area and had a history that at the time I met Van Overlaid uh, of a couple of years of involvement with a non-human intelligence that was coming and visiting them, uh, I guess we kind of tend to call it abducting them, uh, conducting various experiments, uh, and then uh, attempt basically wiping the memories of the occurrences from their minds, and it opened up uh, my eyes to what became the abduction phenomenon. I mean, I was initially interested because of the technology and these crafts and these wonderful pictures that were being taken by so many different photographers. I mean, I, I even had the occasion over a couple of years to take uh, four separate television camera crews from around the world, and including network tele television camera crews in the United States. They're on location, and in every case, they were able to get their own live footage. So it really begged the question, you know, you, you talk to people and you say that, well, UFOs are real. What they are, you have to be determined, I suppose. But the fact is, is that this is a genuine phenomenon, that these things are actually going on. Whatever it is that's going on, there, uh, there's evidence left behind, uh, quite a bit of evidence, in fact. And uh, people will say, well, how come I don't hear it on the news? I said, well, probably because you don't watch all the news channels every day. Because uh, it certainly gets recorded, and it certainly gets broadcast, and it's out there in abundance. So that <laughs> that was one shocking thing. Is the and, and these television crews were not attempting to ridicule the events that were going on. They were merely interested because it's an intriguing news story. But as I quickly learned, news stories, the news phenomenon is just uh, it's a sensationalist business based on ratings and something that's intriguing uh, gets broadcast and published and then it goes away sure you know, the there's a life cycle associated with it that unless there's new or additional information that can be built upon what was presented it will just somewhat die out die out and move on to the next thing well that that's one element that uh, came to play. The other element was is that we were looking at extraordinary equipment. Uh, right beside Gulf Breeze is a naval air station, the Pensacola Naval Air Station. And over the course of a couple of years of uh, going down there for extended periods of time and conducting investigations, uh, I mean, we witnessed uh, military aircraft come and chase these things away. They were coming in with such incredible regularity. They come out of the water, they come out of the sky, they go back into the water, uh, all these things being recorded <laughs> regularly, on a, literally on a daily basis for, a, for an extended period of time. And uh, they, in one case, uh, there was a substantial sized craft that parked over a shopping center for a couple of hours one afternoon. And, of course, there'd be a couple hundred people would, you know, gawk at it. Then... Uh, one of the Navy jets would come flying in and chase it away. <laughs> it was, it's just unbelievable. So there was no indication that you saw that these were actually coming from Pensacola Air Force Base, but that there was a reaction from the military to the presence of the UFOs and USOs that appeared in the Gulf Breeze area. Well, it, it goes well beyond just that element. Uh, one of the investigations that I first started when I developed... Uh, uh, the Annapolis Research and Study Group here, uh, 
when we were conducting investigations into a number of unusual things that were going on in the Chesapeake Bay area, which was one of which was precipitated by the loss of a million fish in one day as a result of an experiment conducted by the Navy here in the Bay. They had developed in the Chesapeake Bay area something called the Empress Project, which stood for the electromagnetic, let's see, EMP, Electromagnetic Pulse Radiation Environment Simulator for Ships, Empress. And this is a fancy term for an electromagnetic pulse generator that sent out a million volt shocks into the water, which obviously you send a million volt shock into the water, you're certainly going to cause some disruption to the ecosystem. And that's what the world's biggest fish fry, yeah. Well, that was one of the side elements to it. Another was they ended up having to close down a bridge because they, in essence, turned the pilings for the bridge into tuning forks and it shook the deck loose and concrete cracked and they had to put steel collars, close it for about three months, they had to put steel collars around the piers so that they could hold the bridge together. Oh, wow. Yeah. And one way to bring the story back down to Gulf Breeze is that suddenly started appearing in Pensacola Bay and on land a variety of pieces of equipment that I had recognized from my research in Chesapeake Bay. They had these electromagnetic pulse generator systems set up down there. Okay, now what's going on? And began to think that, you know, are we looking at a war going on here? I wasn't sure exactly what was going on. Who had set up the systems in Gulf Breeze? To the best of my knowledge, it was all run by the Navy. But the Army was involved as well, as we would later see when we saw some of their trucks and equipment there. This was, they had tremendous eavesdropping equipment, portable eavesdropping equipment that was brought in on trucks and elevated on towers, all looking around into the water. So clearly there was a defensive posture that was being exhibited by the military in and around the area. And keep in mind, this was going, you know, we're having, I guess you'd have to call them UFO, just because of the fact that they are unidentified, flying objects that were appearing on a daily basis. And in numbers, too. It wasn't just like one craft. I mean, frequently there would be, you know, like five of them that would come in. And this was all being recorded on film and video. And Dr. McAbee and I had set up a camp down there one summer for an extended period of time with all kinds of equipment. We were finding that we needed to pull in Geiger counter equipment, electromagnetic detection devices of all kinds, because we would have incidents where a craft would come in over a pond and, for whatever reason, suck water out of the pond. And it would leave a signature in the trees in the surrounding area that was detectable on electromagnetic devices. So, you know, from a technology standpoint, it was absolutely fascinating environment to be. It was a laboratory that was active and ongoing. So that really got the attention of everyone. Sure. Just a quick question here for you. Was your interest in research that you were conducting at this point in time just personally based, or had you joined MUFON at this point in time? And then also from Dr. McAbee's involvement, having been a researcher and an officer for the Navy, I guess the same question as to why he was down there. Was it his own personal interest in research, or do you believe he was there on an official basis? Well, our involvement began when Ed Walters had found a local MUFON had found these, had found Ed Walters in these pictures that he was taking. And Ed wanted to have a top photo analyst take a look at the pictures for him. And that's how McAbee got involved. And I had been involved in the Fund for UFO Research, as I mentioned, 
uh, prior to my involvement in MUFON, but closely after involvement in uh, the fun video of research, I did in fact get involved with MUFON and studied their investigators and manuals and learned all about the organization and what they were attempting to do. And uh, so I certainly subscribed to, to that effort as well. And uh, when um, Maccabee brought the uh, pictures that Ed had taken to uh, fund for Yavo Research, and we started to analyze them, I was intrigued because uh, there was one of the individuals uh, thought they were fake. And he was uh, you know, explaining why he thought they were fake. Now, keep in mind, these are Polaroid pictures that were taken initially. And then, sure. uh, and then a videotape. Uh, Ed also shot a videotape right in his backyard uh, of a craft that was flying right behind the high school. Now, clearly, I mean, and this, this is a pretty clear video, the, the object in the video flying around, it wasn't like streaking out of sight. It was This was hovering and just motion, you know, sl the motion was just kind of floating around in the, in the field behind his house, behind the high school there. Right. And this is prior to any national uh, exposure to what was happening in Gulf Breeze, correct? Oh, yeah. Yes, definitely. Oh, yeah. Well, well ahead of all of this. Well exposure. before that. Yep. Yeah. And uh, so um, I remembered that these pictures were taken with a Polaroid camera, and I was familiar with that particular uh, camera. And uh, uh, so I knew that the rollers uh, caused certain aberrations in the film, especially if the film was aged. And as it turns out, uh, Ed was a rather thrifty individual, so he thought nothing of buying exposed film. You see, as a custom builder, he took the, he kept this uh, portable Polar Polaroid camera with him all the time. Uh, simply because uh, he took pictures in the progress. He had a lot of different subcontractors that were involved in these houses he was building. And he would go in and take pictures after they had finished and before the next crew came in to do there so that uh, if somebody messed something up, he could you know, attribute liability and get a, the proper parties to come and fix what was messed up. This was the sole reason he kept the camera in his truck all the time. And as fortune would have it, because of that, he was able to get pictures of these objects that were flying around. Little did he know at the time that the reason they were flying around so close that he could take pictures of them is that he was one of their subjects of interest, uh, which is another story altogether, which blossomed uh, later in the investigation. Uh, and, of course, when I found out with uh, Dan, you know, I, I met Dan Overlaid because he had become one of uh, Dan Overlaid's patients or, uh, you know, subjects, uh, clients or something to that effect. Uh, so that, that sort of brought that element of it together. Uh, but my interest was in, uh, you know, these pictures were the best I had seen of any UFO case that up to that point that I had really reviewed. Now, there were a lot of old pictures, uh, uh, black and white pictures that were taken way back decades before this that were very, very impressive, but for all intent and purposes could perhaps easily be explained as somebody having, you know, throwing a hubcap in the air or something and getting a picture or whatever or something like right. that. Right. Uh, so, so, I mean, although they might be impressive, uh, they could also easily be dismissed perhaps. Whereas these were very difficult to dismiss because one, there was a tremendous abundance of pictures. Uh, they were not always the same craft. And frequently, there were multiple craft involved. And there were other people seeing them. And as it would quickly surface, other photographers were taking pictures as well, uh, giving them to the local newspaper, uh, dropping them off in a drop box, not wanting to get involved and caught up in any kind of publicity. And you know, it was, it was, it was becoming, by the day, a more intriguing case. And, it certainly did. I mean, I, I spent quite a number of years uh, involved in the case. And the Polaroid pictures, and I go back to the fund for UFO research, where, uh, where there were skeptics regarding the initial pictures. Um, I got actively involved in this element of the investigation simply because uh, uh, I was intrigued with Polaroid photography, of which I had some experience with and was fairly familiar. I actually went to Atlanta and visited the Polaroid Corporation to study how the emulsion was applied uh, to development of these pictures, how, these, how, how the film itself was made. 
And I became very intrigued about a number of elements and created a process uh, which we called a light blasting technique in order to create an analysis. And I took each one of Ed's original photographs and put them on a drum and exposed them to 5,000 Kelvin light, uh, 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 light bulbs and re-photographed with a 35 millimeter camera at every f-stop. So we had a full range of, of density exposures. So you can look at these things, you could you know, fine tune it down where virtually all of the light disappears into the picture except the first source of light. Uh, the emulsion on these Polaroid film pictures was made in layers. And as a result, uh, when light is exposed to the film, it sort of like burns down through the various layers of uh, the emulsion in order to give you the image. And what's so intriguing about this is that it's not very easy to uh, uh, create a fake picture without it easily being detectable. And that was the first time I had seen pictures where, okay, now we can take, we can blow these things up to the point where blow them up in terms of so much light on them, we can pull out every little latent detail. Now we're being able to see the actual structural elements within these craft, because some of these pictures were taken from almost directly underneath the craft, right up into the, uh, the bowels of the craft, if you will. Oh, okay. So, and, and uh, the, you know, from a, from a technologist's viewpoint, these pictures were pure gold because it told us so much about these vehicles. And uh, from all of that, we're you know, hoping to be able to determine, well, what kind of propulsion system is this? What, how do these things operate? Um, what, you, know, you, know, you know, all of these questions about well, why are they here and what's this and you know, all the other things that go into the sociology issues uh, were sort of taken a back seat because we were so intrigued with the technology elements. Sure, and, but, and very important from a, a preliminary standpoint is it sounds as though through the research that you were able to do and these techniques that you developed that you were able to ascertain that these were not uh, abnormalities or anomalies within the camera or the film or there was no apparent uh, way that you could determine that there was any hoaxing that was going on, but that what you were looking at were act indeed actual pictures and photographs of real objects, if you want to call it that, in the sky that were being taken with these uh, with these Polaroid cameras. Well, that's true, but, but it also gave rise to the elements that were being used as the uh, conclusion that the photographs were fake. And by that, I mean, uh, with the Polaroid camera, they have these rollers so that, you know, as I mentioned, when you take a picture, you grab the end of the film and you pull it out through these two rollers that compress the, it starts the uh, actual development process, the chemicals that are applied to the film. Right. Now, on an older camera, and especially with expired film, it is not at all uncommon, because we were able to duplicate it a multitude of times, you get these vertical bars across the picture. Right. That, uh, are areas where, uh, where the rollers had passed through and hit you know, pockets of uh, chemicals that started the, uh, um, you know, the process of development. And uh, so the vertical bars that they were using as an excuse to say, well, what they've done is they've faded out the bars that these were just posts that the crafts were perched on, and it was a double exposure. Well, we did thousands of double exposure uh, tests to try to duplicate uh, the pictures that we were looking at. And by the way, Ed also was using a 35 millimeter camera and taking pictures from that as well. Actually, it was a stereo camera. We started providing Ed with equipment, and uh, Bruce McAfee developed a stereo camera uh, using two Polaroid Sun 600 cameras, which is an advanced model from the initial camera that Ed was using. And he got pictures with everything we ever provided him. We would seal cameras up with wax, uh, with a seal on them, so that if they had been opened by anyone, uh, the evidence was there. We did. We, we took every possible precaution we could dream of to try to uh, eliminate the potentiality for faking a picture. And 
the case became extraordinarily complex over a long period of time. One of the things that came out of it that, to this day, leaves many scratching their heads, including myself, was that on one event, Ed actually got abducted while he was taking pictures. I say abducted, meaning a craft came in, he's taking pictures, a blue beam comes out of the craft and starts depositing these little short creatures onto the beach. And they basically were all coming around, closing in around Ed to take him aboard the craft. They had a device, which we subsequently learned is essentially called a monorod neurocontrol device, which dispenses a pulse of some form of electromagnetic energy, perhaps it's a blast of plasma, we're not really sure exactly what it is, but the objective is to essentially knock out the victim. And essentially, they call it, the victims themselves call it a whiteout as opposed to a blackout, because what happens is all of a sudden everything goes white and then they go unconscious. Ed got pulsed with the thing, but purely by accident, his tongue was caught between his teeth and activated a pain sensor. If you ever bit your tongue, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And the activation of this pain sensor overrode the monorod neurocontrol device and Ed was still conscious. He grabs one of these creatures around the neck and subsequently was able to get some biological debris under his fingernails, which we were then able to retrieve and ship off to a laboratory at the University of South Carolina to do mitochondrial DNA analysis. The results that came back were surprising to everyone. It didn't take a scientist to conclude that it was organic material. We had it in a little vial. You open the vial up and just take a whiff of it and you can tell it is indeed organic. Very pungent odor. The material turned out to be something that, to my knowledge, science had not encountered before, which was a silica-based organism as opposed to a carbon-based. Very, very intriguing. Wow. Later, through the investigation, we learned that these little creatures that were coming down here were, in fact, synthetic biological androids, not the true intelligence behind whatever was interested in Ed and his life and the rest of the sociology that goes on from there. But they were synthetic biological androids dispensed to basically obtain the subjects of their study. And Ed certainly was one of those. And what they used, so since Ed did not get knocked out by this pulse, you might be asking the question, well, then how did they, what happened next? I don't want to leave everybody hanging, so I'll explain that little portion of it as well. They had implanted images at this point in Ed's brain that if he didn't give up, they were going to go and get his daughter. And they were showing him images of his daughter back at the house, which was literally a quarter of a mile away. Right. And at that point, Ed gave up and submitted to the abduction. So that's an extraordinary story, one of just many. That's just one incident that went on by the dozens on a regular basis over a period of years there. And, you know, I mean, that case alone took up so much of my time and got me so fully immersed into the UFO phenomenon and that it just simply added so much more to the research that I had done with the Chesapeake Connection, which we haven't even discussed yet or how that started, that kind of brings much of this together as to how a fairly rational, intelligent human being could find himself 
so fully emerged in something called, a, you know, something like an alien phenomenon. Sure. I mean, now you're being presented with data. You've got uh, photos and information that you've been able to replicate, that you've been able to test. You've been able to speak to the individuals and all of the information that's coming your way, or at least most of it coming your way, seems to be uh, corroborative and supportive of what others are seeing, especially, you know, I love the stereo cameras that Dr. Maccabee put together or this uh, information and testing that you were able to do with the material that came out from under the fingernails of, of Ed and taken to uh, test in South Carolina there. Um, I mean, all of that is uh, certainly worthy of them pulling you into and becoming uh, totally immersed in the subject at that point in time because I could see how even in just this one particular sliver of what's going on out there that this is enough to study and stay on top of and become uh, completely devoted to uh, spending your time researching it. I mean, that's, that's all just really quite incredible. One of the questions that came up here as we were discussing this a little bit is um, Dr. McAbee's impressions both at that time and whether or not you're aware of what his current impressions are of what he saw down there and then uh, of the uh, ufology uh, research and study that he's done through the years in general. So, you know, did, did he really walk away from Gulf Breeze with the, the same thoughts that you had regarding what you were seeing? Or um, do you, are you aware of what his particular viewpoint or opinions were of the data and photos that he had been shown and studied? Gulf Breeze generated, probably, I, I think you'd have to probably say that Gulf Breeze was the uh, biggest case uh, in the history of ufology in the sense that there was an abundance of evidence, photographic type evidence for one, uh, the physical evidence on the ground, um, active contact of multiple, multiple families that it has to be considered uh, the most prolific case in history in terms of what it gave us to evaluate the UFO phenomenon with. Uh, and you're, with regard to your question, you know, I don't want to speak for Dr. McAbee, but based on things that he has published publicly and continues to discuss to this day, I'm sure Gulf Breeze ranks as, if not the number one, certainly one of the number one cases, the top cases that he's ever been involved with uh, that provides us with enough information to uh, clearly recognize that it is beyond a genuine phenomenon. Uh, we don't know who these people are. And I call them people because of lack of a better term, but we really don't know the intelligence behind the phenomenon as it relates to Gulf Breeze itself. What we do know is that they definitely are there, uh, that they have equipment capable of flying through the air and getting into the water with equal ease in and out of the water. Uh, that they, we, we learned that they use uh, creatures that are uh, synthetic biological beings uh, to do the groundwork, as it were. Uh, and there's insights that go well beyond that, and quite a number of books that have been published, both by Ed Walters and others, uh, relative to the events that transpired down there in the late 80s and early 90s. And uh, the sightings continue to this day, so it's not like it's gone away. Uh, but, I mean, what had happened in Gulf Breeze was a phenomenon in ufology. Uh, it brought interested parties, MUFON groups, uh, the Mutual UFO Network people, uh, skeptics. It brought uh, uh, the media. It brought everyone into this small little town of about 5,000 people and touched them with something unusual to our daily lives that we call the UFO phenomenon, which in essence represents a non-human intelligence interacting with us uh, in our everyday life in a very, very incredible way. 
that uh, certainly <laughs> will make you scratch your head and wonder what is life all about and where do they come from, who are they, why do they, why are they here, what do they want from us, uh, why um, 